Alan Moore is the closest thing that mainstream comics has to an auteur writer. He helped usher in a bold new era in storytelling. He's also the direct cause of many of comics' shortcomings and problematic tropes. I'm Dave Baker. Today on Total Nerd, we're going to explain Twilight of the Superheroes, Alan Moore's unfinished epic crossover comic that would have served as the definitive ending to the DC Universe. We're going to break down what the story was, evaluate the characters involved, and examine why it fell apart. Before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Total Nerd channel, leave a comment, and let us know what Total Nerd topics need an explainer next. Today, it's popular to bash Alan Moore for his strict adherence to a gritty realism and a deconstructionalist approach to comics. However, in the 1970s and the 80s, his approach to comics was jaw-droppingly inventive. Many of the people who don't enjoy this modality of storytelling are in many ways heaping blame on Moore for the ripple effect that his works had on the rest of the medium, as opposed to evaluating the work for its own merits. But, you know, that's comics. From his iconic runs on characters like Marble Man and Swamp Thing, to Watchmen, his boundary-pushing book with Dave Gibbons, Moore casts a long shadow over the mainstream comic sphere. But more importantly, when he was a young man, he rocked some of those mean-ass blunt cut bangs, baby! Yeah, yeah, this is the same photo from the Watchmen video, but we are gonna take any excuse to talk about Alan Moore's BCB. In 1987, just a year after the smash success of Watchmen, Moore submitted a 33-page proposal to DC Comics for a universe-wide crossover event. Yes, I know what you're thinking. Wait, didn't Alan Moore have a massive falling out with DC over the rights to Watchmen and other editorial issues that basically drove him away from the company? Well, yeah, he did. We'll get there. But as of 1987, Moore is still on good terms with DC. He'd been discussing what his next project would be with Paul Levitz, the future president of DC Comics and current editor. Moore spends the initial three pages of this 33-page document discussing the commercial viability of his pitch and reiterating some of the finer minutia that he and Levitz had gone over through their correspondences. Moore's proposal was for a book called Twilight of the Superheroes. It was going to be a companion piece to the likes of Dark Knight Returns, written by Frank Miller. It was to serve as an ending for the DC Universe. Moore posits that all myths need a concrete ending to ascend into legend, and accordingly lays out a plan for how to construct an end point for the universe without hampering stories or boxing in creators. The brief synopsis of the story is that the Twilight of the Superheroes takes place roughly 30 years out from where mainstream continuity was in 1987. There are two narratives that make up the story, a framing device and a central story. The framing device follows a time traveler, Rip Hunter, as he's sent back in time to the year 2000 by John Constantine. He's sent back to 1987 to find, you guessed it, John Constantine, in order to stop a horrible future where humanity lives under the boot of a ruling class of superheroes. The twilight of the superhero's future sees a feudal system being enacted, where major clans of superheroes are basically split up into eight houses. The House of Steel features Superman and Wonder Woman. Having married, they're ruling over much of the eastern seaboard. Diana has changed her name to Superwoman, and they have an unruly son and a kind-hearted daughter. The House of Thunder, which includes my boy Captain Marvel and his Marvel family. Marvel is distinctly different at this time, though. Gone is the smiling, apple-cheeked, big red cheese. Marvel is now married to Mary Marvel, his sister. He's dour, he's withdrawn, he's solemn, and stern and commanding. The House of Titans is composed of the still remaining members of the Teen Titans. A brooding Nightwing leads the team. He's broken up on the inside over the death of Starfire. Cyborg, well, he's more machine than man now, and is losing his humanity with every coming day. Same thing with Beast Boy, who now spends most of his days in full hybrid animal form, choosing to go by a new codename, the Chimera. The House of Mystery, which is made up of the mystic characters like Dr. Fate, Jason Blood, Zatanna, and Spectre, well, they don't factor into the story too much, they're just kind of there for added flavor. The House of Secrets is built upon the background of the old DCU's greatest villains, and it runs the entire entirety of the state of Nevada. Joker, Lex Luthor, Dr. Savannah, Captain Cold, and Grodd actually look out for the inhabitants of their domain. They don't want to incur the wrath of the larger superhouses. The House of Justice is constructed on the remains of the old cavern headquarters of the Justice League. The team is composed of younger characters who've now grown up into new mantles. So Kid Flash is now the Flash, Wonder Girl is now Wonder Woman, as well as Dr. Light and Captain Comet. 
the House of Tomorrow is comprised by time travelers. You know, you got you got your Space Ranger, two or three Rip Hunters, Jonah Hex, and of course, Barry Allen's The Flash. Finally, last but not least, the House of Lanterns, which is actually more than just a bunch of Green Lanterns. It's actually any alien living on Earth. Thanagarians, Lanterns, Ranians, whoever, you name it, they're there. And basically, they all form the House of Lanterns. They've all been pushed off of Earth, though, by the House of Steel, deemed too much of a threat. They all now live on the moons of Mars. The document goes into many details about the state of the world and the supporting characters and their roles within it. One character who features prominently in the story is The Question, as he attempts to solve a murder of a short man found strangled while visiting a prostitute. There's a runner throughout the whole series that takes place, much like the news agent sequences in Watchmen, that takes place at Sandy's Place, a bar that is run by the old phantom lady. There are numerous character vignettes that, you know, kind of show smaller slice of life moments like Doll Man and a jingoistic Uncle Sam, and Black Hawk basically giving up on life. Moore positions this jingoistic version of Uncle Sam as a Greek chorus showcasing that the world is dark and totalitarian, and it's really gone downhill. In this section of the doc, Moore then alludes to the fact that Batman has been rumored to be active, but no one has seen him in like decades. At the time the document was produced, DC also had the rights to The Shadow. Yes, The Shadow. The only the Shadow knows Shadow. Remember him, he'll be coming back later. John Constantine uncovers that Superman and Captain Marvel are going to marry their eldest children, thus forming an alliance of the two most powerful houses and de facto taking over the world. As the multiple subplots crescendo, Constantine goes to the various factions, playing people off of one another, attempting to convince them that these disjointed factions need to work together in order to stop the point of no return, which is the House of Steel and the House of Thunder joining forces. He develops a plan that includes the Titans, the Justice League, and villains attacking the wedding in a do or die last ditch effort, with an intent on preventing these demigods from joining forces. Inevitably, they attempt this, and when they do attack the wedding, it's a bloodbath. One woman is killed by Superwoman, who gets then killed by Captain Adam. It's an all-out brawl. The plan fails. The House of Thunder and the House of Steel are triumphant, standing back to back, waiting to see what the next assailant will be. Well, as it turns out, it's an alien invasion from the House of Lanterns. They're tired of being relegated to Mars. They've been looking for their moment to strike, and this is it. Thanagarians, Lanterns, Martians all pour out of a portal and make a beeline for the wedding party. Superman looks up at the oncoming horde of adversaries and says he's not worried about it at all. With all the combined powers of Captain Marvel and Superman, these would-be usurpers will be no match. And here's where the trump card comes in. Captain Marvel isn't Captain Marvel. Billy Batson has been dead throughout the entire story. You see, the unforeseen side effect of being Captain Marvel is that Billy Batson's human body didn't age, even though his mind did. So as he grew up and needed adult experiences, he wasn't able to attain them, and as such, was driven insane. In fact, remember the murder of the short person at the beginning of the book that the question was investigating? Well. He wasn't actually just a little person. He was a child, and he was Billy Batson. He was murdered by the Martian Manhunter, who has been shape-shifted into the form of Captain Marvel ever since, which is why he was so aloof and withdrawn throughout the series. Superman kills Martian Manhunter, and single-handedly takes on the army of aliens, killing thousands of assailants. And yet, at the end, he's overwhelmed by the sheer number. He just barely loses to the alien invaders. It's all over. The aliens have won. We've just traded one feudal dictatorship for another. Or maybe not. John Constantine shows up with an army of humans led by Batman, who has been secretly training with the Shadow so he can cloud men's minds and become invisible. This crew o humanity's last hope are all clad in golden armor, thus rendering the Green Lantern's abilities null and void. If you didn't know, lantern rings don't work on the color yellow. John Constantine and his cohorts take the day, but at what cost? At what sacrifice? How many deaths? Throughout the story, Constantine is constantly espousing his belief in his own brilliance. He's consistently saying that there's no one that can outwit John Constantine. At the end of the book, he's given a letter by Rip Hunter as an apology from a future version of himself. It turns out that the only person who's smarter than John Constantine is future John Constantine by sending Rip Hunter back in time to tell young John Constantine to prevent the Twilight of the Superheroes from happening, he actually caused it to come true. 
which is exactly what future John Constantine wanted. In a one-page denouement sequence, John Constantine, feeling frustrated and bested by his future self, goes into a bar in an attempt to distract himself. Earlier in the book, we're told by Rip Hunter that the key to this whole series of events is that John will eventually fall in love with a woman. They'll be in a bar, she'll ask him for a light, their eyes will meet, and that will be it. The future will be set in motion. Depressed and defeated, Constantine orders a drink. A woman approaches him and asks for a light. He looks up at her, knowing it's her. He sits there for a moment, realizing this is how he can best his future self. This is how he can have his revenge. He can deny himself his only true love. No, I'm sorry, I, I don't smoke. She leaves. John Constantine just drinks quietly in the corner of a darkened bar and cries. Moore pitched this book as a 12-part maxi-series, in the same way that Watchmen had been produced. 28 pages an issue, no ads, all killer, no filler, baby, as the kids say. However, it never came to be. Yes, I know what you're thinking. Alan Moore, he was so pissed at DC with the way they were treating him for Watchmen. That's why this never happened, right? He just rage quit. Ah, uh, kinda. However, to the best I can tell, that friction wasn't until years later. Alan Moore, as well as Frank Miller and some other people, were very upset by the idea that DC Comics would start to institute a rating system on their books. So for background, at this time, comic book shops were literally being arrested for selling mature comics to kids. Literally. Like dudes were going to jail for this shit. So, in order to protect retailers, DC was going to start putting advisory labels on their books. These are mature readers. You know, little barcodes. Moore, Miller, Marv Wolfman, Len Wein, and a bunch of other people hated this idea. But video games have a rating system. Movies have a rating system. Yeah, that's true. But Alan Moore and Frank Miller, they would disagree with you. They would say, name a piece of literature which has a rating system. Unfortunately, Moore and Miller left DC because of this. Jeanette Kahn instituted the rating systems and they didn't go back. Until Frank Miller went back a bunch of times. You can say a lot of things about Moore, but you can't say that he doesn't walk the walk. Taking a moral stance on the validity of the medium and choosing to walk away from a lucrative publishing relationship because of it? Man, if that's not some badass, snake-worshipping, bearded wizard bullshit, I don't know what is. Well, what do you think? Could Twilight of the Superheroes been the spiritual sequel to Watchmen that we all really wanted it to be? Does this pitch feel kind of similar to Kingdom Come? Well, that's because Mark Waid and Alex Ross were inspired by it, so you're, you're on the right path, but good looking out. Will we ever get an official end to the DCU, like Alan Moore pitched? Is that the only way for these modern myths to ascend into legend? Only time will tell. If you liked this video, please comment below and let us know what other areas of nerd culture need an explainer. And in the meantime, like, comment, and subscribe for more Total Nerd videos.